Hello. Hey, what's up? How are you? <laughs> Dr. So George, how, how are you? How's DC going? It's good. Weather is starting to get hot. Traffic's getting bad again, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. George, thank you so much for being here tonight. Anesthesiologist, former rock star, songwriter, yeah. you're a girl dad, you're an idol producer. And as my friends have called you, tall, dark, and handsome, you have it all, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. George. Well, how did they know I'm, I mean, how did they even know I'm tall? They said you seem so tall, but... <laughs> I am actually pretty tall. I'm 6'2". Uh, <laughs> six, 6'2". I'm, six two. Six two. I'm yeah. just one inch below you. I'm 6'1". So... No, but, I, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're in the tall gang. <laughs> I used to have hair about your length. I saw. Quarter, but I used to have hair that was pretty long. I'm envious. I don't think I can pull it off anymore. Yeah, it's been so hot. I'm planning to like cut it soon. Dr. George, you could just introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah, yeah and it's, I mean, the COVID has brought out for so many people these new, you know, there's obviously the bad part of it. But then there's also a lot of positive things that happen. Like mm -hmm. this for you, even reaching out to so many people created a big following. And I see you're helping out a lot of docs really get their voice heard. You're really, really good at that stuff. And I've tried to adapt with COVID as well, doing new things myself. But yeah, in terms of my journey, originally from Florida, I lived there my life until I went to undergrad, went up to DC to visit and I fell in love with DC and didn't think I'd still be in DC since I was in 2000. So for anybody wondering, that's a really, really long time ago. But um, <laughs> so that was my journey. I always kind of knew I wanted to go into medicine and I started as a biology major, but actually right away I got out of biology and I actually went into the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And honestly, I think the only reason I did it because I like knew like a lot of people went to Georgetown before that, like Bill Clinton and right, like, all these people that are like, I thought were like pretty cool and I was like oh, I'm gonna do the same classes they took that was in and of itself a little bit non-traditional I was doing like organic chemistry with international relations and all this other stuff and it was actually a lot more work than I or wanted to do but went from there to med school at Georgetown <laughs> I stayed there and actually before that before med school I did the whole touring thing so I actually was in a band at the end of undergrad I did this band at Georgetown called Cabaret mm -hmm. and it was basically this thing where like a bunch of undergrad kids every year it was like a thing where you tried out and then you did a big show at the end of the year and all these kids would come out to a venue in DC and actually watch it play and so I did that and then from there I like made that into a band outside of that cabaret thing and so I kind of caught a bug a little bit at that point of wanting to of wanting to play in music so actually I took time off between med school and I played in the band I toured around it was in a band called Midnight Roger which none of you guys should look up it's not good <laughs> It was, it was, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. It was not good. It, basically, it was like jam band potheads mm -hmm. and nothing against potheads at all, but it's just very hard to work with potheads. <laughs> and like literally, it'd be like 20 minute songs. I'm like, that's not my style. Like, I like yeah. four minute bangers. <laughs> <laughs> And these guys were like, and like literally would be doing practice at my house. And then I remember hearing a knock, a ring in my doorbell and somebody was actually dealing weed into <laughs> my house. I'm like, oh yeah, this is not going to work. So from there, I moved on to being in a band called Crash Boom Bang, which is the one I ended up doing much more seriously. You know, I did that for a while and then I was like, oh, well, I should also do medicine too. And so I was kind of doing it at one point simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So I would be doing things like we'd be on tour, like right off the, right off the bat, we actually toured with this band called Plain White Tees. They did mm -hmm. their big song with Hater, was mm -hmm. Hater Delilah. Mauricio was a drummer of our band. He's actually, I think he might be on this chat here, but um, <laughs> shout out Mauricio. He toured with Tom Higginson from Plain White Tees and he was a hookup. So basically right when I joined the band, we toured with Plain White Tees as Hater Delilah was blowing up. And so we were like, you know, slowly seeing our venues get bigger and bigger mm -hmm. as we were touring. I was thinking, oh, this is just how it is all the time it was a ton of fun and mm. so basically i'd be on the road i would have the med school notes with me and like i'd be in the back of the van i say i say back of the tour bus but it actually means van but, <laughs> you know, and i would study and i would read and i would study yeah. And then I'd fly back home to do the exams. At that point, I was doing the exams are every month, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So I would just fly back to the exams and then go meet them back out on the road or recording, whatever it was. And so it was a pretty crazy lifestyle and pretty non-traditional. For sure. <laughs> and then from there, I decided around the end of third year, fourth year, that I wanted to do anesthesia. I was always kind of on that surgery route like, mm -hmm. i liked surgery and i was thinking maybe plastics maybe ent mm -hmm. and eventually decided that anesthesia was probably more my speed in terms of i like the fact that you can be in the or like case or you can do stuff mm -hmm. with your hands mm -hmm. you know you do arterial lines you can do mm -hmm. central line intubations mm -hmm. use a bronchoscope all these really cool things and fast pace i didn't really want to be in a clinic setting mm -hmm. and so it can be a situation for anesthesia where you can work as much as you want or as mm -hmm. little as you want yeah so basically it could be in a shift work kind of mentality, much like emergency medicine, ICU, which are pretty much the only ones that I can think of that are like that.
So, yeah. so that really killed me. And I decided anesthesia was the way to go. And from there, you know, it's crazy for anybody that under knows medicine and the road, you do this match where basically mm -hmm. you just put in your name and you could be anywhere. The and computer matches you. <laughs> yeah. So I could have been anywhere, but the way I hedged against that is I only ranked one place, which was Georgetown. <laughs> My rank list was only one place. Uh, Fortunately, I got into Georgetown. You were meant to be there, Doc. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been never locked that up. I've been, I'm actually feel lucky to be here. Like, could be anywhere. And uh, I feel fortunate to be here. And I like DC a lot. Yeah, fast forward, I'm an attending there. I have two kids, two awesome girls who just left right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'd want to be on this thing. I know, right? <laughs> but the world of medicine and music, of entertainment, it's like two polar opposites. So I actually did minor in theater in college while I was taking up nursing. So I would, I would also run from my clinicals in the hospital, then straight to the theater department to take an acting class or whatever. Yeah. And people always tell me, just like you, Doug, it's like different worlds. Basically, the flow is different. What you're learning and you're trying and practicing is different. Where did that love for music stem from and that love for medicine as well was there anyone like in the family that was in both fields or you know um my parents came from taiwan my dad was an engineer my mom owned an ice cream store so definitely no music they didn't listen to any music like literally just classical music that was it but like my influence really was from my brother he was the one that introduced me to most of the music tastes that i liked so stuff like led zeppelin guns and roses those are the reasons i picked up the guitar because of him there was a guitar hanging around but of course i had a one up him so i was like i want to take this i'm gonna like be better at you in this and i really try to work really hard on it to get to the next level so my love of music was really i was part of the mtv generation in like the 80s mm -hmm. so i grew up on like hair metal guns and roses poison motley Crue, all that stuff and like what <laughs> better or worse kind of idolized that era but i mean, know it's like not really kosher now but um <laughs> but that's why i got into music that's why i picked guitar i wanted to be the guitar hero on slash any of my bandmates know that they know that like they share a love of guns and roses with me so it was very much understood <laughs> But that's how my love of music came about. And then I honestly, I'd always dreamed about playing live, mm -hmm. but didn't really do that until high school. So, mm -hmm. so I was in a band in high school that played a, a talent show in the high school. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, like, I want to do this. That was it. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, I just had a hard time finding people to play, play music with. Mm -hmm. So I had that band and I had a summertime band between in college. And they actually named the band Chaucer, not because of me. They just like the name Chaucer. That's my middle name. And then from there, went to another college band called Space Camp and Midnight Roger and Crash and Bang. So I've had a few bands, but Crash and Bang for sure was the one that I like, did on a high level. Yeah. Do you think that lifestyle of a touring rock star, just music in general, do you think it helped being a doctor, whether like qualities or characteristics or like the yeah, work? Yeah, yeah, I, I actually do. And one thing about being on stage, you know, I'm not, I wasn't like the front man by any means, mm -hmm. but I would talk in front of the crowds, you know, mm -hmm. I would play in front of anywhere from very few people to a lot of people. And that really helps get any kind of like speaking nervousness that I might have. I used to be pretty, I used to be really shy. Still I am, but like, I'm okay with talking in front of people mm -hmm. and being in a band helped me so much with that. And that can translate over to patient care, like in yeah. a major way. Because, yeah. I mean, imagine being an awkward first year med student or first time resident and trying to talk to the patients and their families. And like, if the cat has your tongue, you're like, you just start showing their nervousness. And that really helped. And then on top of that, my band, we, we did a lot of DIY stuff. So, like, yeah. we did, I mean, when I talk about DIY, like to promote our band, we would go to other people's shows that were like our music and we would literally stand outside. So, nuts like we would so there's a, a local club called 9 30 club and my bandmates and i would just literally have our cds or flyers and just stand mm -hmm. there handing out flyers to everybody but then also trying to engage with them so it's like the art of the cold call or cold email and so that was like major uneasiness right like yeah, of course, people sure. don't like doing that i don't like doing that yeah someone yeah. was asking did you start an instrument prior to guitar to help shape your love or time with your music or was it guitar from day one that was number one always i was like the bad asian i didn't do piano or violin or that stuff I, I went with like the one that was like i don't know that Rock was the best show yeah, yeah. <laughs> i never wanted to be that guy that, that was like around the campfire playing like kumbaya mm -hmm. i like mm -hmm. i like wanted to shred that's like my number yeah. one priority was like shredding a guitar like yeah. clothes and like i definitely didn't do it for the girls i was just like i just <laughs> you just liked it yeah are you sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah
<laughs> it seems like your love for music never left you, Doc. Even until now, you're an idol producer, right? You have yeah. your own entertainment company where you are training the next generation of music. Can you talk more about that, which I believe is called Future One? Future One, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's I'm really excited about that. And you're right. I went through a time where I didn't do music between bands, and like that was really hard, actually. And I, mm -hmm. I was like, I think I was like borderline depressed. I was doing mm -hmm. zero music stuff, yeah. and that made me realize I have to have one in my life some way or another hopefully in a meaningful way and so future one it really like afforded me an opportunity to like keep that going even though i'm not like in this i'm not like writing songs for them though maybe one day i will i just haven't had time for it but what i'm doing is so basically this company was started by our crashing bank's manager mm -hmm. and he told me back in 2012 he's like hey you know what i'm thinking about starting a chinese music company like k-pop like bts mm -hmm. like that's how it was. i was like say no more i'm in on this let me know how i can be involved in any way so fast forward like several years, I stopped doing the band, I stopped doing songwriting production, which I did a lot of before, then started helping out with the company. And what I did with that was like, I would do consulting. So the whole K-pop model is the same mm -hmm. as what we're trying to do. So we basically mm -hmm. find talent from China, mm -hmm. they audition, and if we think they're good or have some hope, we sign them. And they tend to be pretty young, 15, 16, 17, mm -hmm. their parents are all part of the conversation, but they rent, <laughs> literally rent out in Beijing, it's in China, we mm -hmm. rent out an apartment for them. And then the building next to them, we rent out a building and it's got, you know, one floor's got a dance studio for they, where they learn choreography. Next one up is a weight room where they can kind of exercise. Next one's a, a vocal studio where they can do vocal training. It's like a full-on facility. It's pretty nuts. And the whole point is we try to get them good, and then we put them in groups and put them onto shows. So that's the whole model of the C-pop, what I call it, C-pop. Yeah. And once they get on these shows, hopefully they get top 10. And if they get top 10, then they can really, they'll be really popular. Yeah. And China's crazy. Like you don't, we don't even need to be big in, in the U.S. Honestly, yeah. you don't need to be big in the U.S. Yeah. As long as they're big in China. Yeah. I mean, it's, so just to put things in perspective, on one of the shows there that we were working on, their regular season show, compared to the voice finale in the United States, the voice finale, like, ranks number one, it would rank number one and on the Nielsen ratings. And just on that, it would be like 10 million people. Now, that would put you at number one. In China, it's a regular season show for this idol show. It's 100 million views, streams. So it's like 10 times more than number one. It's just the economies of scale. Like, it's just nuts. If you can get an artist that top 10, like, yeah. they're good to go. Here's actually set. For sure. And I actually saw you posted that one of your artists, like you teamed up with 88 Rising. And for those yeah. who don't know, this music platform where they try to offer Asians and Asian American artists to hopefully be released their music or their work here in the United States. And can they team up with big names like Jackson Wang or other yeah, K-pop yeah. idols? Yeah, but that's huge, yeah. Yeah, so that's so great that one of yep. your artists is actually doing great things. Yeah, it's cool. Over in, so there's a 88 Rising has a division in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and a division in China. And yeah. In China, they do a lot of the shows. They've started doing the shows. And yeah, so like one of our artists, her name's Adawa. They, mm -hmm. She signed with 88 Rising. Oh. And, you know, caught the ear of like Brian Manuel, Rich Brian, like one of the, mm -hmm. he's pretty big over here, actually. Rich Brian, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so far it's going pretty well. We've got her with like, some really good sessions with people. And that's part of my job, actually, is to find mm -hmm. songwriters, producers that I know from the States, mm -hmm. to hook them up with our artists, mm -hmm. with songs or songwriting sessions. It's been fun. I, think, I will say it's so much better being on this side, on the buyer side. Yeah. I used to be on like the weak band side <laughs> or songwriter side, like, please like yeah. my song, please <laughs> like, take it, do yeah. something, pay me. And now it's so much better being on the other side. I still use music because I have to listen to these songs and screen mm. them, and make sure they're appropriate. So yeah, it still uses creativity. Yeah. And I, even until now, you still really utilize music. So I've read about um, the Hope for Henry Foundation, which oh, yeah. I saw, which is you are one of the board directors. And for those who don't, I like that. <laughs> and for those who don't know, it's like, they create these programs to help hospitalized children to yeah. adhere to their medical plans and whatnot. It started off with a kid named Henry who had Fanconi anemia, right? And yeah, yeah. it's like you've used your connections in the world of music to bring in artists like Diplo yeah, yeah. or Charlie Puth and Cody Simpson. Can you talk about that? That's so fun, yeah. Wow, you did your research. I, I respect that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so Hope for Henry. So basically, whenever I had friends or if I knew people that were coming into town to D.C. on tour, I'd be like, wouldn't it be cool if they went to the hospital and like talked to the kids and like, gave them free stuff that would uplift them or you know sing to them, give them signed stuff if they wanted. And I always thought that was cool, partially because I know like we were not huge, but I remember being on tour and I was thinking like, I've got time to kill, like to be awesome and do something productive. And so I think knowing that lifestyle sort of, got me and i know 
a lot of people do this anyway. A lot of to Seacrest Foundations, they do a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff, and they have that at Children's Hospital where I bring most of the artists. But yeah, whenever I'd see an artist come by in DC, if I knew them or if I had some connection to them, I'd hit them up. Most times, I knew somebody there, but I've done a cold call. I've done the cold email, <laughs> and like, hey, you know, like I said, I have no shame in sending out emails. I'd, yeah. So yeah, so they would come, and we had some really awesome people come, and basically, these kids lifted their spirits up. Yeah. The whole point of Hope for Henry, it's such a great organization. Yeah. The whole point is to make kids that are in the hospital feel like they're not in the hospital yeah. at least less like it mm -hmm. so it's really just making sure they don't feel like they're stuck like they're mm -hmm. like a, a not fun environment yeah again talking as a whole in the world of music you were able to balance it right in the beginning you would go on tour you would do your assignments at the back of the band tour bus <laughs> and then go to go for that once in a month exam did you ever feel like it was was music your main passion and if so, how would one choose between passion and a stable career? And I think that's a very prominent topic even in Asian culture, right? There's professions that are esteemed, right? And there's parents who are against their children pursuing things, let's say, in the art that may not be, you know, connected to stability, as, as we saw during the pandemic, especially. What, what's your advice on that, Doc? How would you advise someone when choosing between passion and career? Or do they have to choose? Can they do both at the same time? Yeah, you know, this has been the theme of my life, really, is like you know, choosing what you want. My opinion is that it's hard. It's, it's like kind of contradictory. I think if you're going to do something and that like, you're super passionate about it, and I didn't follow this, to be honest with you. But if you're super passionate about it, then you don't have a plan B. Yeah. And those people tend to succeed. And I always had a plan B. I always knew that I wanted to do medicine. Like I had to mm -hmm. a route back to that. I always had a fallback plan. But mm -hmm. a lot of my friends, they didn't have a fallback plan and mm -hmm. they grinded it out. And some failed, a lot of failed and some and a lot didn't. So that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, I do feel that me personally, if I had done this full time, I mean, maybe it's just I feel I would have worked really hard. I feel like I probably I could have like made it big in some way, mm -hmm. either as an artist or a producer, writer or whatever. I feel like I probably could be pretty far on that. But honestly, when I when I did it with medicine, I did the music stuff pretty like more than part time. It was a lot. Like I probably spent as much time doing that than I did in medical school. Mm -hmm. to be and I felt that was a lot of effort. And even then, I think we got pretty far, but I feel like I gave it a pretty good effort in terms of being an artist. So I would say if anybody's trying to pursue their dreams, and if it's medicine or if it's whatever, if it's in music or theater, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you have to really know you want it. And you may not want to have a backup plan because yeah. that's going to make you work so hard. Getting known to rock bottom, I think, will really push you really hard. On the other side of that, I've actually been asked a lot of times from other docs talk to their son or their daughters mm -hmm. because they're like you know i'm trying to talk to my daughter or my my son they want to do music but i think they shouldn't do it mm -hmm. like can you just talk to them and usually when that happens i'm like all right if you don't mind i'm gonna to talk to them but you can't be there i really want to assess what their actual drive yeah. is yeah and so if i talk to them and it sounds like they are driven and they know more about music than i do which mm -hmm. i know a fair amount but if they mm -hmm. really want it and they're young they gotta know more than me yeah. If they know more than me and can talk and like knows the scene, then I'll be like, okay, you probably could do this full yeah. time. They're like, don't know much. They didn't research much. Or they're like, and if they play me some songs and I can tell they don't spend a lot of time on it, I'll be like, I don't know. Maybe you should have yeah. And there's something wrong with that. Yeah. So I think it really depends on yeah. the drive. I think really it's just the drive that you yeah. have determines yeah. whether you should go for it. Yeah. And now, like, having been an attending physician for some time, you've basically gone through it all, the whole pathway of medicine, which is long and stressful. It's arduous, time consuming. Given all of that for this journey, do you have any regrets that you chose medicine? No, I mean, I, I actually love medicine. I actually do like what I do quite a bit. It's hard for me to think of another field that I would really enjoy. I do like it a lot. I, it is a long road, but, you know, I, I don't regret it, honestly. It's definitely made me feel like a whole person. Like, I, I just feel like whole with this. Mm -hmm. the whole decision to be somebody that, that cares for people in this kind of way so that would definitely be missing if i didn't do it i think i don't regret it at all oh, yes. yeah and given that there are no regrets i think that also stems from the point that you love what you do right and that you enjoy what you do what is the one thing about anesthesiology that you really love the most about it yeah there's a, there's a few things but mm -hmm. most is I have like canned answers i have like answers i would tell like an interview but i know like really what i like about it is that I like the pace of patient care. You know, I'm not a big, I don't love the clinic setting. 
what I mean by that is I can basically we can go from, from the pre-op area where they're very nervous, whatever, to anesthesia for surgery within minutes. Mm -hmm. And you've done a good thing. You protect them against surgery, you protect them against pain, and very fast. Right. Like, it's crazy. Like, it still blows my mind. I, I'll say this to residents, too. I'll be like, mm -hmm. isn't this crazy what we're doing? Like, I'll, I'll be pushing pro football. Like, isn't this, like, completely nuts what we're doing? Like, they're literally talking to us one second, and next mm -hmm. they're out. Like, just think yeah. about that. Yeah. We're putting them on the brink of death. Yeah. and bringing them back yeah like, that's crazy <laughs> i get the yeah. thing like, i still think about it today so i like that aspect of it that it's mm. it's very quick you can provide a lot of relief anxiety relief safety for pain and stimulus and then bring them back mm -hmm. and it's I, I like that aspect it's all fast yeah. in yeah. clinic you do like oh yeah you have high blood pressure you have diabetes take this drug and mm. three months later come back and it's, yeah for me that's not the pace that i like you see quick results too like immediate like, results yeah, yeah. Exactly. And are you specializing in anesthesia? Like, I know there's some who do cardiotherapy. Yeah, is there a specific? Yeah, there's, I, I don't. I'm in general anesthesia. But yeah, in terms of the fellowships you can do, you can do uh, cardiothoracic pain, acute pain. And then mm -hmm. there's regional, for, like nerve blocks. Mm -hmm. And then there's OB, which is not super popular. And then there's, mm -hmm. what else? Oh, pediatrics. Pediatrics. Yeah. And so, what's the bread and butter of general anesthesia? Like, what yeah, are the usual procedures? Yeah, so bread and butter are going to be your lap apis, lap coles, mm -hmm. so gallbladder removal, appendix, GI, which is like colonoscopies, endoscopies. Most ortho is pretty bad bread and butter. But even honestly, spines are pretty bread and butter, at least mm -hmm. in Georgetown. We do, Georgetown does transplants. That's like what the, we would say like we're unique with, like liver transplants, small bowel transplants. Mm -hmm. that, but, but yeah, we, we do it all. Someone said he doesn't have to deal with grumpy patients. Yeah, he knocks them out. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. I don't mind that part. Yeah. You get grumpy patients, then usually short lived. <laughs> he knocks them out right away. Propofol um, is an amazing drug. You know Propofol. Oh, yes. I like how um, you have a heart there. Like, you do cardiac, right? Yeah, I'm in cardiac surgery step down, actually. Yeah. So, and I float sometimes to the cardiothoracic ICU. So that white drug, that white milky yeah. drug, Propofol, that's, everyone's, that's yeah. everyone's saving grace. <laughs> yeah. How did COVID affect your work as an anesthesiologist? Flashback to last year. I feel like one common knowledge about anesthesiologists is coming right away intubate patients, right? And with COVID-19, everyone's like respiratory distress. Everyone's getting vented here and there. Is that what happened in your practice? Yeah, it was crazy. I'm not going to lie. It was, <laughs> COVID was crazy. It was, I didn't know what to expect. It wasn't like New York, but, you know, it still was... The unknown was a big thing. So it affected me on, on a professional level and on a personal level. Mm -hmm. On a professional level, it was like, okay, what the heck is this thing? I remember the first time somebody said when um, it came to the U.S. It was like, oh, my God, there's one in California. Like, crazy. And then, like, next thing you know, a couple of days later, oh, it's here in D.C. Yeah. And they were like, how rapid is this going to happen? Yeah. Is this actually going to go away? Mm -hmm. The hope, yeah. yeah. Obviously, that didn't happen, but we didn't know. And I remember we had to change our schedule completely. We doubled our call. So basically, we went from regular OR call, which we still did, but mm -hmm. then we doubled our overnight calls so that mm -hmm. we did COVID call. So mm -hmm. COVID call meant that we were literally there for airways. So that would indicate that we're busy enough to be doing airways all night. And so some nights we would do four, five airways, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd have ICUs that were full. And and at that time, we didn't know anything about it. And so it was nuts. I will say that our anesthesia team was very meticulous about everything. We, had, we had a whole protocol, like how to don and doff our stuff. Yeah. You know, it was literally like, you know, put on your gown. When you take it off, bend over and just pinch it off. Don't ruffle it up. It was like very specific. And like, it was just, it was almost comical watching us do it versus like mm -hmm. people that were like in and out of the room in the ICU. <laughs> but yeah. we were they probably thought we were insane, but that just shows you how much we really didn't know about it. And the, I would say the most marked thing was, well, when they, by the time they saw me, the anesthesiologist is going to intubate them. And that's not a good sign, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's very dire. You need an airway. Yeah. And it was very heartbreaking. I mean, I deal with ICU patients more like when I was a resident, mm -hmm. but being there and you know, being at the head of the bed with the drugs ready, with the intubation stuff, I had a papper. I had all that on. Them being in there, I, I can, it's so heartbreaking to even think about it. I remember this distinctly many times. Like the patient would be there, labored breathing, on an iPad, talking to their family. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is really the last time there's stuff. And, and then they would say stuff that was like, all right, I guess I'll see you. I'll see you after this. I'll see you later. I'm like, yeah, oh. they, do, they don't. Oh. Yeah. They would they'd say to me, oh, sorry, I'll hurry up. I'm like, no, no, not hurry up. Yeah. Just take time. Like, yeah. It was so heartbreaking. It was, it was horrible. Yeah. It, it, and, it, it, 
So, you know, just being, and then on top of that, the fear of contracting it itself, mm -hmm. you know, you're right in the airway. Yeah. I mean, that's as close as you can get. Yeah. And bringing um, it home to your girls, right? Yeah. So, so that goes on to the, how it affected me in my personal yeah. life. So my ex-wife was so worried about it. Mm -hmm. and I was worried about it too, but I knew I was doing all the precautions I could. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see my girls for two months mm -hmm. straight. Like, I, it was, didn't see them in person for two months. And mm -hmm because of COVID and yeah. that was extremely hard. And yeah. so two months without seeing them, just FaceTiming them and it was really hard. That took a, that took a pretty big emotional toll on me. And, yeah. uh, and I, I remember, I remember seeing them for the first time again after two months and it was like, it was, it was very like touching for me, but uh, yeah, no, yeah. it sucked. <laughs> that whole trip. Sucked. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really sucked. Sometimes when people still ask me about it, it's like, I really tried to repress some of the memories because we saw it, right? Doug, some of the, craziest things happened during those times some of the most heartbreaking things happened and i'm glad that slowly we're getting back to normalcy some yeah especially with the whole rollout of the vaccines right yeah. well that was the hardest part is like when we would see this and then there'd be mm -hmm. people out there saying oh it's fake yeah Doctor yeah doctors and nurses are doing are getting paid to, to say by the that. government to like yeah. talk about it but, and like i understand you don't see this but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist because you don't see it I agree. It was, it was very disheartening to hear stuff mm -hmm. like that. That was a big component, actually, as to why I wanted to start this series, too, is to actually take it like an inside look at the stories of physicians and other clinicians who have gone through that. People have been asking through pre-submitted questions, what are some of your most memorable memories as a physician, whether it's a medical student or a resident or an attending, whether it was the scariest or the weirdest thing you've ever seen, the most uh, heartbreaking? Yeah. I tend to remember the crazy stuff. Yeah, usually. <laughs> um, I mean, there's like the good stuff, but it's, a lot of that's crazy stuff, to be mm -hmm. honest. I think one of the craziest ones that I've had to deal with was, I remember I was in a hospital, I was moonlighting. That's another thing mm -hmm. we could talk about, was like moonlighting and doing locums. I dabbled in locums and stuff. I was at a hospital I'm not used to, and I remember getting a page. Yeah, we still use pagers. <laughs> that's so ridiculous. Um, and I remember getting a page stat to the emergency room. And for me, when I get that, I'm like, okay, it's usually like an airway that I need to do. So, okay, I'll, I'll run over there and help out with an airway. And when I, as I got there, it was late at night. I got there. There was a crowd of people around this room. And I was like, oh, that's weird. That like a lot of people. And as I walked in, people were like, oh, great. He's here. He's here. Like, like come, come over. And I walked in. I see a surgeon with a scalpel and a patient, a pregnant patient on a stretcher. And she's like having a hard time breathing. And basically she's like, all right, great. You're here. I need to get this baby out. And I was like, oh, crap. So luckily I had IV access. And basically I had to immediately induce anesthesia, intubate. And then immediately after that, baby was out in the emergency room. I never had this. Like, that was at a community hospital. That's like not normal. Yeah, community, yeah. Not normal to have to deliver a baby that urgently in an emergency room. Usually you can make it up to L&D, labor and Yeah, yeah. That was for me. And in this place, I had no residence. I was the only one there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so I remember I induced with ketamine, which I never, I rarely ever, yeah. I like out of my hands how many times yeah. I had ketamine. And it ended up the patient had status asthm asthmatic. So basically really bad, couldn't breathe, yeah. exchanged, and that affected the baby. So they started having deceleration. That's what they needed to come out. But yeah, I get the airway in. So for anybody out there knowing that, or wants to know for OB patients, they're the, those are the highest risk airways mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm because their aspiration risk, mm -hmm. they usually have their lower esophageal sphincter mm -hmm. tone is low. And so whatever's there can come up pretty easily. Yeah. They're already grabbing, so there's a lot of yeah. baby there to already push whatever food yeah. is there up. On top of that, their airways are smaller and demodus. So the airways can be a lot tighter. So you don't really ever want to intubate pregnant patients. Mm -hmm. So this is just fraught with really bad things that can happen. Yeah, I can so, imagine how stressful that moment was oh, for you. Yeah, I don't stress oh out God. often, but I was like, I was pretty, uh, yeah. I was definitely kind of, my heart rate was up. I was like, okay. <laughs> you were having accelerations of your heart rate. Having, yeah, he was having D cells, I was having X. You were having accelerations. Wow. Oh my gosh. And bless the mothers. Bless yeah, the she made it out okay, by the way. So that was great. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Oh my gosh, that is wild. I mean, just seeing a regular childbirth during clinicals, I was already like, oh, yeah. I can't believe this is happening. And how much yeah. more like in an emergency situation, I cannot even imagine. What are your tips for pre-med students or med students or interns who are in this journey and they're convinced this is what they want to do, but despite of all the stress and how hard this process is? Oh man, yeah, tips for med students is, 
Wow. That's a tough one. I will say that I remember starting out as a med student and thinking like, you always hear about how hard it's going to be and how long a road it is. But when you're that young starting out, you're just like, I'm game for it. I'm game for this all. I will say best thing you do is just like buckle up because it is hard. It's a long road. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, when you're a resident, by the time you're a resident, you're like, I'm ready. Like I need to be a real person. Yeah. And so I would say just kind of mentally prepare. Like it's a long road. It's not quick. I know that's not really advice. That's like, but I think mm -hmm. I just remember when I heard that, I was like, oh, whatever. I'm down. I'm young. I'm, you know, I can handle this. And you can't handle it, but it's, it is hard. Yeah. Um, academically, it's hard. The tip I would say on an academic level is that, okay, I'm a crammer. I've always been a crammer. Always have been. High school, always studied the night before, been known to do all nighters. You cannot cram for med school or residency. You just can't do it. No. The idea of cramming in med school is a month before. That's like cramming. You start you're studying a month before, you're cramming. <laughs> and that's just not my style like i was never the person that was like every day do a little bit so yeah yeah that's why i'm so amazed that you were able to go on tour while being a medical student yeah it was, that was wild i, 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 can't, I can't believe you did that that was really hard i have a pretty high tolerance for pain though. yeah it was very hard i don't i don't recommend doing that necessarily but uh someone's asking do you have a playlist for stressful medical situations and i think that ties on to what i wanted to ask is how do you decompress from work. Medicine is such a high stress environment every day. Do you have out of work hobbies or like rituals that you do to like? Yeah, you know, I, it's always been, I always had music. So I, for me, it would be like playing guitar, writing music, producing music on the computer or performing live because I was always in that mode. More recently, I've been doing a lot of whole wellness thing, mind body mm -hmm. medicine. I actually teach residents this stuff. And this all has to do with physician, physician wellness and burnout. Mm -hmm. Medical professionals are committing suicide at a higher mm -hmm. clip than in the past. And so it's a bigger deal. The recognition is a lot higher. Uh, right now, I do stuff like meditation. I wish I could say I, I did it more, but meditation, and it doesn't have to be like long, hour long meditation, even like mm -hmm. 10 minutes at a time. And sometimes I fall asleep, you know, that's fine, but I still try. And that does help me. It doesn't have to be sitting down and doing it. You can just literally a walk or working mm -hmm. out stuff like that that, mm -hmm. that can be meditative and finding your own time alone really helps yeah. that's how i deal with it yeah and how do you balance life like being a dad with two cute girls and uh, thank you girls? how does that work i guess probably because i'm 24 and yeah and not having a family but how do you balance that is it true that you just, you just have to do it <laughs> you just have to do it you have to just have to kind of schedule ahead but you have to want whatever you're doing you have to be intentional about it Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing, another pearl I, I hope is a pearl for the people mm -hmm. is for me at, at my stage, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things at work, mm -hmm. be on this committee, do this project, do this academic project. They'll ask, and, and then even in medicine, in a medical school or as a student, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things. And for me, it's just coming out of like a priority list. What are the things the most important to me? So me, me girls, mm -hmm. career, I don't, and then my other side stuff, but mm -hmm. like music, podcast stuff, oh, whatever, finances. I'm really big on finances mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. stuff, like personal finance, like good investor. So that also, that's like, that's all like on my priority list. So other things I'm being asked are not congruent with any of that stuff, then I don't do it. So basically, mm -hmm. I used to be a yes man. Whatever committee people ask me to be on, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, sure. You know, I'll be a good employee. But for me now, my motto really is, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no. Yeah. So it's got to be a hell yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Because yeah. I just don't have time to do it. I've gotten better at saying no to it. Mm -hmm. And you just have to be. Because then I don't have time. I'm going to spread myself out too thin. Yeah, and I think... <laughs> but I already do. But, you know, I yeah. try. And I think that's where what you said, like, about well-being and self-care really comes into play. Because, yes, there's a lot of priorities. But it's like you also have to find the center in yourself, right? And you've been open on other podcasts about your divorce, right? Yeah. And I actually listened to the White Coat Investor oh, podcast no, and the you. Doctor Podcast Network, your episodes there. And you talked about how important it was for you to go to therapy, given that, like you said, the heightened rates of physicians dying by suicide, right? Yeah. From burnout, from yeah. exhaustion or whatnot. Well, how do you think people can cope with those things? How, how do we avoid those kind of situations? I don't know how you can avoid some of those situations, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, like with physician suicide and all that stuff, I don't, that, that stuff's hard. Yeah. I, think, I think awareness, like the biggest yeah. Knowing to recognize the signs of it, which is hard. Most people are not forthcoming. In medicine, it's especially hard because people don't like talking about mm -hmm. that stuff. Yeah. Just like people don't like talking about divorce. They don't like talking about lawsuits. They don't like talking about that stuff. So that's what I find being open about it is helpful. Like there aren't many people talking about their divorces, and maybe I should. Maybe it's going to bite me ass sometime down the road, and maybe it will. But I find I found that I, I had like two resources to look up mm -hmm. from other docs that had gone through it, and that even that helped me. 
And so I'm not trying to be the divorce doc, but yeah. it's a part of my life. I went through it yeah. and I think if it, it can help other people. And that's why I talk about it so openly. I mean, I don't talk about like nitty gritty. I don't get my like social security number or anything, but yeah. you know, I tell what, you know, sort of pitfalls and what, how to recover financially. I don't go into the emotional part so much. Yeah. I mean, I can, I just, yeah. there's no podcast about that. So <laughs> most of the podcasts I've been on are, have been about like being a dad or, yeah. Fine. but yeah, it, it's, it's all, I think it's good to be open about that stuff, but docs are really bad about being open. <laughs> yeah. They're just, they're just not. And that's why I want to talk about that. Yeah. And you mentioned about your Rockstar MD podcast. Can you talk more about that? I actually have like a bunch of episodes I'm lining mm -hmm. up and I'm actually going to publish it probably tomorrow or the next day. And I've got a lot lined up. So I was using that white coat investor as kind of like a platform springboard mm -hmm. for that. So I've actually been wanting to do it for like two years. <laughs> wow. And I've actually had the domain name for like, I'm not even joking. I had the domain name for probably like 10 years. I just never did anything with it. Rockstar MD like, has been in existence, has been in ether at some point. And I just, but this goes to tell you, like you just, sometimes you just got to start something and not be ready. Just not be ready. Just, just yeah. do, if it sucks, then it sucks, but you, you can build from it. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I'm sure my podcast probably isn't like, gonna be the best but i mean it's the best i can make it right now but yeah that whole thing has been great and that's it's been about the whole topic of that is it's like a wellness financial wellness blog not masquerading but kind of like wrapped up in this yeah. idea of looking at other docs that are doing great things yeah. like i'm interviewing a lot of highly functioning the top of their game docs yeah and kind of dissecting what their mindset's like yeah but coming out of medical school, the average debt is around two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars, and you're very adept in the whole financial realm, right? Yeah, the, I read about that. Like, yeah, what's every day. your biggest tip to medical students or even the residents who, by common knowledge, are not getting paid like attendings are? <laughs> um, paying a lot, and the interest is really high. Honestly, my advice is do as much as you can. Do, do like, be good at medicine stuff first. That's all new to you. It's hard to be good at, it's hard to read up on your finance. If you're in med school, I think just be, just focus on that really. I mean, if you have time to read a book on finance stuff, then it's great. But yeah, you're gonna be 200, 200K in debt. I was $220,000 in debt. It seems like insurmountable, especially when the interest rate's like 7%, which mm -hmm. was for me at the time. But I think once you become a resident, you, know, you start really thinking about how you're gonna attack it. The whole idea, what I tell people, and this is white code investor ethos, is live like a resident for five years. And that's so hard to do. It's all delayed gratification, right? When you're yeah. done with med school, you're done with residency, you're already in your 30s or later. Yeah. And so you're telling these people that are in their 30s, who have friends that are in their 30s that are buying big houses and nice cars to live like a resident for five more years. That's yeah. a tough pill to swallow. You're like, that, yeah. that, I'm going to spend my money. I'm going to get that car, that doctor car, that doctor house. And just don't do it. Just you can't do it. Yeah. I did it. I, I to be honest, I did all this stuff. Um, <laughs> but I also took away my debt and I really attacked my debt pretty hard. Yeah. And then I also had a divorce, which is also the number one yeah. thing you should not do. <laughs> the saying is one house, one spouse. And I effed that up. Yeah. <laughs> so another horrible financial mistake. So I've made a lot of financial mistakes, so I'm not mm. perfect. But I'm at a better place now. I've been disciplined about it. I've I've done a fair amount of reading, but Mm. During COVID, I definitely lived like a resident I, mm. for the most part. I mean, yeah. I, I was very mindful about what I spent my money on. Mm. And yeah, less travel, less. I mean, it's great with the pandemic because everything was closed in the first place. Yeah, on top of that, I was scared I was going to lose my job. So yeah. I was like, I got to conserve. I got to go in like true nesting note mode here. I can't, yeah, can't. for sure. Thank, thank you so much for being so vulnerable and being so transparent, especially with all of this things that you call failure and pitfalls. It's, it's very nice to see physicians who are, you know, transparent about how life really is. Um, I feel like in society, it's like permanent, proper, esteemed, but the journey it takes to get there and to where you are now, especially the wild ride you've been on, being in the world of music, which is so cool, by the way. Um, when, they started, when they started promoting our life, everyone was like, what he was a rock star turned and you see yeah that's that that a huge part of my life a huge huge part of my life yeah but it's not as i'm not like on the road anymore i'm not mm, like yeah. studios and like but that was a huge part of my life and met some really cool people that are yeah. still doing amazing things in music right now for sure i mean with feature one to continue all of that that, yeah. is, that is so exciting someone said in the comments earlier that they're so glad that c-pop and k-pop are making it to the mainstream yeah which which is really great especially also for 
the topic of representation, right? So for sure, yeah. yeah. So thank you for doing that as well, Doug. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Well. I'm so excited too, especially with 88 Racing. I've known that company for a while, so I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Hopefully it'll be Future One that is like, oh my God, Future One. <laughs> future One, Future One. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And of course. Thank yeah. you so much, Doug. I had so much fun talking to you and I've learned so much. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me on the show. Of course. Thank you, Doug.